Okay, so now we're going to talk about section two, which is all about water, which is an extremely important molecule, an extremely important compound when it comes to living things, because living things consist largely of water. All of our cells contain water. In animals, our blood contains water. The fluids that our cells are bathed in are water-based solutions, so it's extremely important. Um, so water, of course, consisting of an oxygen, two hydrogens, it's a covalent molecule. That is, the hydrogens and oxygens are bonded together by a covalent bond. But there's polarity to the molecule. And although the, the oxygen and hydrogens are sharing that pair of electrons there and there, it's not an equal sharing. The Electrons spend more time on the oxygen than they do on the hydrogen. Um, because the oxygen is, is, we would say, it's more electronegative. That is, it really attracts those electrons more so than the hydrogen. So because the, ox the, the electrons are spending more time on the oxygen than over on the hydrogen, the oxygen side of the molecule basically has a slight negative charge, and the hydrogen side of the molecule has a slight positive charge. And so that's what we mean by the polarity. Even though overall it has no charge, there's a little more negative on one side and a little more positive on the other side. So that's what we mean by pol polar. And these kinds of molecules are known as polar covalent molecules. All right, so what does that mean? Well, that polarity means that um, water molecules are sort of sticky. That is, they stick to each other. The positive side of a hydrogen will stick to the negative side of an adjacent molecule, or oxygen. And this kind of stickiness, this kind of bond, is what's known as a hydrogen bond. And it um, gives some gives water some unique properties. So, for example water molecules stick to each other, and that's what we call cohesion, water molecules sticking to water molecules. And because of that polarity, water molecules will also stick to other things that have a charge. And so that's what we call adhesion. So a water molecule consisting to some other thing, or sticking to some other thing, that basically has a charge, whether it's positive or negative. And so in this picture here, this is a blade of grass or some kind of piece of a plant. And you can see those water droplets are basically sticking to that plant because of adhesion. And the water molecules in this droplet are sticking to each other because of cohesion. Um, this property also leads to something we see in water called surface tension. And again, because those water molecules stick to each other, when we look at this bug, this water strider, it's, it's so light, and you can see its feet kind of extend out on its legs there, if you will, that when it sits on top of the water, it just kind of pushes on the water and doesn't break the surface of the water. And that's what we call the surface tension, the, the idea that the water can just kind of be pushed down a little bit, but not broken. It's analogous to, say, a, um, a trampoline where your weight sort of pushes down on it, but doesn't break it. It just kind of bends. And so that's what's happening to the water right there, is it's just being pushed down a little bit. Um, now, of course, this can only happen with things that are relatively light. Um, we, it doesn't happen to us. If we get on the surface of water, we break that surface tension and fall through, basically. Um, but at small scales, it can be very important. Now, water also has um, what we call a high heat capacity. In other words, water mo molecules, water can hold a lot of heat. And so this is relevant in a couple of different ways. First of all, as you know, if you try to, when you boil water on the stove, try to cook some pasta or something, you have to heat it up for a while. It takes a lot of heat 
to get water to boil to for its temper temperature to change. Um, it also means for us uh, a couple things as well. So I, I put this picture in here of Nadal because he's he's working hard playing tennis and sweating. And as you know, you sweat when you get hot. Okay, well, what does that have to do with the heat capacity of water? Well, essentially, when those beads of sweat form on your skin, the heat from your body causes that droplet of sweat, which consists mostly of water, to essentially evaporate, to go from a liquid to a gas. And you have to put heat energy in a liquid to make it go from a liquid to a gas. And so essentially when you sweat and that sweat evaporates off your body, it's taking heat with it and helping to cool down your body. Um, also, because again our bodies consist mostly of water, and water has a high heat capacity, it can basically retain a lot of heat, your body temperature does not change a whole lot, and it's not supposed to, again, because of all that water. So you could, for example, might just be wearing shorts and a t-shirt and go into a cold room or go outside where it's colder and you can feel that it's colder but it's not like your body temperature changes very quickly okay your body's able to retain a lot of that heat um, even though you walk into a cold space or outside where it's cold <clears throat> okay of course water is a good solvent sometimes described as the universal solvent and so it's the basis of solutions in little uh, in living things. Essentially, when you have a solution where water is the solvent, it's known as an aqueous um, a q u e o u s solution. That is a solution that is water based and has water as the solvent. Now, you've probably talked about solutions before. Um, of course, solutions consist of the solvent and the solute. The solute are the particles that are basically uh, dissolved in a solvent. And again, living things have water as the solvent in all of their cells and around their cells. And so such a solution is known as an aqueous solution. Um, now, um, the book here also talks about other ways in which um, materials can be found in water, because not all things dissolve in water. For things to dissolve in water, for those solutes to dissolve, it, it helps for them to basically have a charge or to be able to break apart such that they form ions, charged particles, because then they stick to the water molecules and basically dissolve in the water to form the solution. So that's what we mean by a solute in a solution. It's dissolved in it. It is particles that have a charge and are basically sticking to the water molecules. In a suspension, you have a situation in which the particles are not really sticking to the solvent. Okay, They don't have a charge. Um, a good example of a suspension is salad dressing, where you have the, the water plus the oil, and the oil is sort of suspended in the water, but it's not really sticking to the water. It's remaining separate. And even though you might shake your salad dressing and the water droplets get smaller and smaller, they never dissolve in the water. That's because oil is nonpolar. It does not have a charge, so it doesn't stick to the water molecules. Um, other times, you can have materials that are so big and heavy and non-charged, they basically just sink to the bottom, and they're not suspended. And so you have what you would call a precipitate. You have that material just kind of sitting on the bottom of the water, again, not mixing or dissolving with the water at all. <clears throat> Okay, another important property of water is that it has what we call a pH. And a pH is essentially a measure of the hydrogen ions 
content of a solution. Okay, so of course we know aqueous solutions have water as the solvent, and in a solution though, some of those molecules, those water molecules, sort of break apart into these two ions. One of the hydrogens breaks off, and then you have this, what's called a hydroxyl ion, a negative ion. There's the hydrogen that's positive. All right, well, what can happen is um, this extra hydrogen can sort of temporarily bond with another water molecule to form this, H3O, which is known as hydronium, okay? So you'll have this hydroxyl ion and this hydronium ion in any water-based solution, okay? Now, if you have pure water, the amount of the negative ion will be equal to the amount of the positive ion, and such a pure water solution has a pH of 7, which we refer to as basically being a neutral solution. All right, now, however, as you look at the pH scale, you can see that you can be lower than 7 and higher to 7. It goes from 0 to 14. And if you're on the lower side, of course, those are acids. And on the upper side, these are bases. All right, well, what makes a solution a base? A base has basically extra of the negative ion, the hydroxyl ion. That is basically the OH negative. The amount of that is greater than the positive ion. In solutions that are acids, it's the other way around. The amount of the negative ion is less than the amount of the positive. Okay, so what's, what is it about bases that give them extra OH negatives, and what is it about acids that gives them more of the positive ion? Well, compounds are present in bases or ad, acids or added to them to make them as such. So, for example, if you add potassium hydroxide to a solution, it will make that solution basic. Because what happens is when you add it to the solution, it breaks apart into those two ions, and now you're adding extra OH negative and making the solution more of a base. Whereas if you add acids to a solution, like hydrochloric acid, HCl, it will break, oops, that's positive, into these separate ions. You're increasing the amount of H plus in the solution, which means you're going to have more of this in the solution, and therefore it's an acid. This plus ion here and this negative ion here, the chlorine, they do nothing to the pH. The only thing that impacts pH is the presence of the hydrogen ion or the hydroxyl ion. Those are the only things that influence pH. No, none of these other ions have an impact. Again, if you got more H+, plus, it'll be an acid. More of the OH negative, it will be a base. All right, last thing, buffers. So buffers are compounds you add to a solution to bring it back to or closer to being neutral. So if you have an acidic solution, you know, it has a pH of 4, okay, and you want to buffer that solution and bring it closer to neutral, then the kind of buffer you would add would be basically a base, like potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. So those would be buffers for an acidic solution. If you wanted to buffer a basic solution, something that had, say, pH of 10, and you want to bring it closer to neutrality, you want to buffer that solution, you're going to have to add an acid, 
like hydrochloric acid,